Every, uh, every song they led us in today was just absolutely powerful. Um, the, the, I'm, I'm confident of this, that there's a certain number of you at this very moment that that last song resonated deeply with where you are in life. You are in a struggle, a challenge, a difficulty, an adversity of some kind. And that song meant so much. The ones I am most concerned about at this moment are those of you who are sitting here today and you didn't see any sense to that song for you. That's where my heart breaks. You see, the words of the song is every hour I need you. It's not every tragedy I need you. It's not every difficulty I need you. It is every hour I need you. Every moment I need you. It is when we are think we are standing on our own. That is when we need him more than any other time. When the adversity is there against us, we know we can't handle it. And so it's easy for us to want to need him. But you know what? If we don't recognize him that we need him, when we think we can be self-sufficient, we are not adequately equipped when we face the inadequacies of our own limitations. Does that make sense? It's kind of like when you're out of shape, it's too late to be in shape for the crisis that you're facing. Okay? You, we, we, we play catch up then. God would love for us to face adversity without having to play catch up. And quite frankly, that is the source of today's message. I invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 1. In just a moment, we'll read verses 12 through 26. If you're new today, you've been gone for a few weeks, we're in the series called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much, you can only have too little. And we spent the first uh, six or eight weeks looking at laughter, and the Bible has a lot to say that. And we're now looking at joy. And what we're discovering is, is that laughter without a heart of joy is very superficial, and it only lasts for the, as long as the laugh lasts. But joy is the foundation. Joy is the fountain. Joy is the person of Jesus Christ, who if that is the source of our life, then even in the adversities and the trials of life, when something is worthy of laughter, we can laugh big, even in a crisis. Because our laughter is not based upon the humor of what is going on around me only, but it is based upon the one who lives within me. And the book of the Bible that talks more about joy is the book of Philippians. It is known as the book of joy. So we're going to pick up from where we left off last week. Starting at verse 12, let me read it, and then we'll look at what it has to say to us today. Paul says, now I want you to know, so this must be important, okay? Now I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And what has happened to Paul? He's in prison. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. In other words, I'm not in prison because I've committed murder. I'm in prison because I've been preaching the gospel, all right? Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others do it out of goodwill. There are always people, even in the context of the church, who have bad motives for what they do. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. But the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. There's envy at work. But what does it matter? What does it matter about the motives? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, Paul says, I will rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help or strength given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 
I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. Back up just one quick clarification. What's he worried about in terms of being ashamed? He's worried about being cowardly in his faith. He clarifies that for us in the next line. I do not want to be ashamed, but I pray that I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my life. Whether it is by my life or by my death, Paul said, I don't want to waver. When the pressure's on, I don't want fear to win. For to me, to live is Christ and to die. Say it. Yeah. It's better. Living's good. Dying's better. If you develop that process of thinking in your mind, it's tough for us to get there. We all like to hold on to what we know as long as we can. Yet Paul said, this, it's good to live. It's better to go where we're going when we die. For I'm going, I am to go on living in the body. This will remain fruit. This will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. Paul said, it's not my choice. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart, be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul's being actually rather selfless here. It's not about himself that he stays. It's for the benefit of others, this church in Philippi that he started years before. He said, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. I brought one of my prized possessions. Most of you know I love baseball. I, I, I played it rarely, but I love baseball. I love sports. We've been able over the years to develop a fair amount of memorabilia in our home. Um, probably the one that makes me smile more than anything else is one of the first pieces that I ever bought, and it's a limited lithograph of the three great center fielders that played in New York at the very same time. Willie Mays, New York Giants, Duke Snyder, Brooklyn Dodgers, and Mickey Mantle, New York Yankees. One time all played in New York. But there are two that are, have a different kind of deep meaning for me than all the rest. And this is one of the two. One of, one of them, and I know it's hard for me to say, one of my prized pieces is a Dodger. God. You have no idea how badly that hurts to say. <laughs> but it's Duke Snyder. Uh, had the chance to meet him, had the chance to play golf with him for a couple of days. Um, had the chance to hear a story of coming to faith. Uh, the other one is the one I'm holding right here. In fact, it's, not, it's never been in our house. It's always been in my office. And this is a Dave Dravecki autograph baseball. I had the privilege of meeting Dave here in Fresno and uh, having a short visit with him and actually handing him the ball to sign for me. And, and because of what the life of Dave Dravecki means, th th this probably in terms of value at a memorabilia store is probably one of the cheapest things I have in my memorabilia. But for me, it's, it's one of the most prized. And I uh, I remember exactly where I was on August the 15th, 1989. Do, do you know where you were August 15th, 1989? I know exactly. I, I, I know that as well as I know where I was on 911, 2001. 2001, I was climbing out of bed. A TV on our dresser was on. I got the first report of the plane crashed into the building. August 15th, 1989. It was the one year anniversary of moving to my house in the country. And I was sitting on the sofa watching, specifically watching this game because I wanted to watch Dave Dravecki pitch his second 
comeback game. Some of you are not old enough to even know who Dave Dravecki is. And some of you might be too old to know who Dave Dravecki is. You don't remember that. He was a San Francisco Giants pitcher at the time. And lightning struck him twice. Dave Dravecki's comeback for the Giants was a great story. After the previous year, a cancerous tumor had been found in his pitching arm. He underwent successful surgery to have it removed. And 10 months after that surgery, after being told he would never pitch again, Dravecki was back on the mound. He gave up three runs in eight innings in his first comeback outing. The comeback tour was off to a great start. Then disaster struck. He was pitching very well in his second outing, giving up only two runs in his first five innings of that game. He went into the sixth. He immediately gave up a home run. The next batter he hit. And then the Montreal Expos' most feared hitter came to bat, Tim Raines at the plate. The pitcher glared at the catcher, checked the runner at first base, and then kicking high, he pushed off the rubber, and he threw as hard as he could. And it was the last pitch he would ever throw. I remember it. There was this loud, sickening crack. It was heard all over the stadium. You see, his arm was weakened by the return of undiscovered cancer in his humerus bone, left arm. He was a southpaw. Dave Dravecki's arm snapped in two that day like a piece of firewood. He said, my arm felt like I'd been hit with a meat axe. He grabbed his arm and he tumbled headfirst to the ground. While his career was over, his adversity had just begun. After a lot of examinations and procedures, the doctor told him that his pitching arm would have to be amputated at the shoulder to guarantee the cancer would not spread to other parts of his body. I cannot imagine what Dave must have felt as the reality of that news set in for a pitcher. He was in the prime of his career, and under normal circumstances, he would have expected to have played baseball for many, many more years. And just like that, it was over. In case you didn't see it, let's look at the big screen. We've got a clip from that day, August 15th, 1989. Watch the pitching mound. Watch the mound. But just five days later, Dravecki threw what was referred to as the pitch heard round the world. Dravecki gives him a look. Here's the pitch to the plate, and it goes all the way to the screen. Dravecki falls down and grabs his left shoulder, and he is hurting. Dravecki is hurt badly. When I was laying on the ground um, with a broken arm in Montreal, um, all I could think was, there is something bigger than baseball that's going on in my life. Several weeks after his surgery, Dravecki went to Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego. It was with the Padres that he first came up into the big leagues, and then they traded him to the Giants. And so he went to that stadium where his pro career started, and he wanted to say thank you for the first of his many fans and friends that he made there. He was greeted in that stadium with a standing ovation. And as on every other speaking assignment since he came out of the recovery room, minus his left arm, Dravecki glorified God and gave praise to his Savior, Jesus Christ. The day after his appearance at that stadium, the San Diego Union said that Dravecki had received over 700 invitations to speak during the next year. The apparent tragedy in his life had all of a sudden began to take on the appearance of victory. I want you to remember throughout the sermon this morning, Dravecki's last line on that video. All I could think of, laying on the ground, all I could think of was, there is something bigger than baseball going on in my life. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a blank line where he said baseball. And I want you to fill in the blank for you. At this moment, some of you may feel like you are laying in front of the pitching mound. 
whatever it is in your world, whatever tragedy or difficulty or challenge it is, at this moment, I believe there is something bigger than what going on in my life. You see, God often has hidden purposes in the adversity that he allows in our life. This is not a message on where does adversity come from. I could spend a couple of Sundays just on that. Let me hit something real quick. Adversity has about three primary sources. Yes, there is some adversity that comes in our life that God actually sends. It's coming straight from him. He knows there's an area of our life that we are not going to grow as long as we are self-reliant, self-dependent, and not fully dependent upon him. And he sends adversity. There is also adversity that comes because of the foolishness of others. Have you ever had friends that did something stupid and you got caught up in the blame? If you didn't, you were a better choice of friends than I was. Eh? Sometimes there are circumstances that are caused by others in your world and you get caught in the overflow. Just like sometimes you hang out with some friends who things always turn out good for them and you get caught in the overflow of that goodness as well. And then anybody here ever done something stupid in your own life? You can't blame anybody else. You, ju <laughs> you just did something stupid and you got caught up. And, and, and there is a fourth. There, there is a fourth. And that is we live in a sin-filled world. Okay, we, we li Noah still had to go through the flood. Hey, why? Because sin was so rampant in this world and he was a part of this world, he still had to go through it. So th those are the four sources of adversity in our life. But what Paul wants us to understand in this particular passage and in this book is that God will find a way to use the adversity even if we are the cause of our own. Even if we do not understand what the cause is, God will not waste it in our life, but this is a matter of trust in our life upon him as we go through the valleys of the shadow of trouble and difficulty. The book of Philippians is referred to as a prison epistle. Like many of the letters that are written in the New Testament, they were written when the author was incarcerated. He was in prison. Paul wrote letters, including this one, while in jail, the book of Revelation was penned by the Apostle John while he was exiled to the island of Patmos. It was in prison that John Bunyan saw the great vision that later became that immortal book called Four of You Knew It. Good job, guys. Pilgrim's Progress. All right, just uh, how many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? Raise your hand. You've Okay, about 15 of you. All right, good. The rest of you... You are, you are deprived literary. You are deprived in your literary legends that you've read, all right? I would encourage you, go pick up a, a contemporary edition of Pilgrim's Progress. Get an updated edition. It's a small paperback book. Won't take you, it probably won't take you more than five or six hours to read it, okay? Uh, it's a quick read. It's not a complicated read, but it is a classic. It's, it's one of those, you know, like, what's another literary classic? Um, uh, Tom Sawyer, okay? Uh, it's a classic. It's an allegory. It's a picture of biblical truth and the image. And it's not even a subtle allegory. The key character's name is Christian. What do you think he's a picture of? Yeah, being a Christian, all right? So, it's, it's, it's a pretty in-your-face, open, understandable, easy-to-understand allegory. It's worth your... Do not get the original version. Okay, get an updated version. The original version would be like reading the original version of a King James Bible. Okay, some of the preachers today who say you're not really a true Christian if you don't read only King James, they are so misguided. They don't read an original King James. They're reading the fifth edition of the King James Bible. I have an original in my office. It is old Elizabethan English. It is like reading Latin, all right? 
It's impossible. So get an updated version. But read Pilgrim's Progress. But he wrote that from a dream in prison. The prisons of our lives can often become places of great opportunity and ministry in our own life and through our life to others as well. One of my other treasures in my library is this book right here. It is ragged. It is not very pretty. But it has right there Charles Colson's signature. He wrote that in a book while I sat across the table from him in Fresno as he was here for a conference for Fresno Bible House. It is one of my top five books of all times. This is the second book that Colson ever wrote. The first one being Born Again, which is his biography of his growing up, his education, and becoming an attorney, getting involved in politics, becoming part of Watergate, and his eventual coming to faith in Jesus Christ. This book is the theology behind his life after he became a Christian. It is well written. It is worth your time to read if you've never read it. It's called Loving God. And prison was the best thing that ever happened to Chuck Colson. Adversity and Watergate are the best things that ever happened to Chuck Colson. He concludes this book on, I believe, page 248 with these words. My lowest days as a Christian, and there were low ones. Seven months worth of them in prison, to be exact, have been fulfilled, but more fulfilling and rewarding than all the days of glory in the White House. And it was the same for Paul. When he referred to in verse 12, the things which happened to me, he was reminding the Philippians that he had experienced some very difficult days. He was writing them in response to a letter from the Philippian church that had been carried by his friend Epaphroditus. These believers in Philippi loved Paul so much and so dearly, they were concerned about his welfare while incarcerated. For two years, he'd been a prisoner in Caesarea. He was now a prisoner in Rome. Because Paul knew of their concern for him, he wanted to put their minds at ease that God was not wasting these opportunities in his life. What were the things that happened to Paul? He does not itemize them in this letter to the Philippians, but if you want to know more about it, go read what Luke wrote in Acts chapter 20 through 28. It's the story of Paul's life. Paul himself summarizes the troubles in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27. I'm not going to take the time to read it this morning, but Paul tells us he was shipwrecked three times. He was beaten five times with a cat of nine tails, 40 lashes less one each time. Got any mathematicians here? How many times did his back get beaten by a cat of nine tails? 195 times. Because 5 times 40 would be 200, right? Minus 5, 195. That's not with a whip. That's not with a leather strap. That is with a cat of nine tails. Pieces of, uh, strips of leather with pieces of rock and metal in the end. And he was beaten 195 times with that. By his own testimony, Paul had this great desire to preach the gospel in Rome, which is now where he's incarcerated. Acts 19 says, I've been to Jerusalem, but I must also see Rome. Romans 1.15 says, so as much as in me, I am eager to preach the gospel in Rome. And Acts 23.11, the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you will bear witness in Rome. When Paul prayed that he might have a prosperous journey to Rome and the will of God in Romans 10.10, I am sure Paul had no idea how that prayer was going to be answered. As Warren Wearsby said, talking about this trip of Paul to Rome, he said Paul wanted to go as a preacher, but he ended up going as a prisoner <laughs> who could still preach. Paul's difficulties actually began when he arrived in Jerusalem. was there he was warned about potential imprisonment. In spite of the testimony of Paul's own dynamic conversion, he was falsely accused by other leaders in the new church. He was nearly lynched by a religious mob. He ended up in prison. He would have been beaten if he didn't let them know that he was a Roman citizen. You see, it was okay to beat a Jew in the Roman laws. It was okay to beat an Ethiopian in the Roman laws. It was okay to beat most Gentiles. You just couldn't beat a Roman citizen. And Paul held that fact, all right, pretty tight to his chest until he needed it so that he could get to Rome one way or the other. Just as Dave Dravecki would have probably never received 700 invitations to speak about Christ's work in his life. 
without his encounter with cancer. So Paul recognized that in spite of his imprisonment, the influence of the gospel in Rome was not stymied, but it was advanced. You see, there are seven proven principles that will encourage us as we face our own troubles outlined for us in the verses I read a few minutes ago. Here's the good news. Your adversity today is not that I'm going to cover all seven of those principles before I finish today. I've already highlighted one. I'm going to highlight one more before we wrap up. I'm going to say the seven principles very quickly, and then we'll look at most of them more closely next week. Number one, adversity promotes the progress of evangelism. Good news in spite of bad times. Adversity provides opportunity for sharing personally. Adversity produces courage in our faith family. Adversity proves the character of our relationships. Adversity provokes maturity in our lives. Adversity purifies our motives. And adversity prepares us with new perspective about life and death. You see, adversity promotes the progress of sharing good news. When Paul was asked about his present situation, he did not discuss his personal discomfort. He was not occupied with his own inconvenience that imprisonment had called. His concern was for the gospel and its advancement. He told his prayer supporters in Philippi that imprisonment had not turned out to be a hindrance, but God was using it to build to his advantage. Listen to this. When he described the advance of the gospel, he used words like furtherance. This is a military term used by engineers that would prepare a road for an advancing army by removing the obstructions of rocks and trees. And Paul viewed his imprisonment as the removal of those barriers to the furtherance of the gospel. One writer expressed it this way. As Paul looks back over the events, the trouble in his life, he stresses that the masses of dark threads that the recent years had woven into the patterns of his life, the animosities, the bodily pains, the lies, the deceitfulness, the miscarriage of justice, the change, the mental turmoil, appealing to Caesar against his own people, the nearness of death on several occasions, the triumph of wickedness and the continued suppression of the truth. Paul invites us to take these things, look them square in the face, for it is these things which have resulted contrary to what the appearance might have suggested in the progress of the gospel. It was true for Dave Dravecki. It's been true for Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson has been in heaven now for several years. But every time you hear the name Chuck Colson, what jumps in your mind? Prison fellowship, prison fellowship, prison fellowship, prison fellowship. The life and ministry of Chuck Colson continues on. Many said after they read the book Born Again, just a jailhouse confection confession. Give him three or four years and he'll be off that. And there was nobody with more significant spiritual influence in the world than Chuck Colson except for Billy Graham at the time that Colson was at the end of his life. God took the worst and he used it for the best. Why? Because adversity promotes the progress of the gospel when we trust in Christ. Second of all and last of all for today, adversity provides opportunity for personal intimate sharing. When the apostle spoke of his bonds being manifested in all the palace, he was referring to the Praetorian Guard, which was kind of like the secret service of the Roman military. These were crack troops. They were paid well and given special assignments. One was to guard prisoners before they had the opportunity of seeing Caesar. Apart from his imprisonment, there would have been no way that Paul could have approached the highest dignitaries inside the palace of Rome. We know that some of them became Christians because in his final words in chapter 4, verse 22 of Philippians, he refers to the saints who were of Caesar's household. Imagine this. Paul is chained inside the Roman home where he was held prisoner 24-7. The Praetorian guards... They changed over every six hours. Every six hours, Paul had two new guards to talk to. Do the math. Two new guards every six hours, seven days a week, 24 hours a day for 24 months. That is over 3,000 opportunities for Paul to share with high-ranking Roman military men. You want to talk about a captive audience? 
they thought they had Paul in captivity. And by his chains, he was sharing them freedom in Christ. And many of them came to know Christ because it's, it's spoken about in the book. In her first book, Corey Tinboom, The Hiding Place, I mentioned a few weeks ago, she told of her experience at Raven's Brusque Prison during World War II where she was a prisoner of war and in a concentration camp. As she reflected on her own pain and suffering, she came to understand that one of God's purposes for this predicament that she was in was that he could use it to benefit the lives of others. She said, God brought me here for a specific task. I was here to lead the sorrowing and the despairing to the Savior. I was to see how God could comfort them through me. I was to point the way to heaven to people among whom many would soon be dying. Marine Lieutenant Cleve McCleary was permanently disabled when an enemy grenade exploded in his foxhole. His evaluation of this adversity moment in his life is similar to Corey Tinboom's and Chuck Colson's and Dave Dravecki's and the Apostle Paul. For he said, I don't think my suffering is in vain. The Lord has used my experiences for his good by drawing many lives to himself. It is hard to see any good that comes from the war in Vietnam, but I don't believe our effort was wasted. Surely some seed was planted for Christ that cannot be stamped out. Like many others who have been through trouble and suffering and tragedy, Paul gave Christ permission to use his trouble as a platform for the gospel. What the enemy hoped would thwart the gospel actually advanced it, if for no other reason than this. You and I should think and pray about our difficult moments. It just might be that God is up to something that is eternal. Remember that sentence I asked you to remember at the beginning of the sermon that Dave Dravecki said? At the end of that video clip, there is something bigger than, you fill in the blank. For Dave Dravecki, it was bigger than baseball. What is it for you at this moment going on with my life? Let me wrap this up with a side background story to Dave Dravecki. Dave Dravecki was drafted by the Pirates. And at spring training camp, he and a buddy were talking about at the end of spring training, they hoped they got called up to the bigs. And if they didn't, they hoped they got traded to the Padres. <laughs> Can you imagine anybody wanted to be traded to the Padres? <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Oh, yeah. And, and here's why. Because they knew if they got traded, they would probably go to the AAA farm team. And the Padres' AAA farm team was based in Hawaii. Yeah, baseball players aren't stupid. Some of them, anyway. And, 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 <laughs> and, and so that's what they hoped for. And at the end of the season, Trevecki got the call from the manager to come to his office. He said, there's only two reasons you get called to the manager's office at the end of a spring training. One is you're moving up or you're moving on. You're being traded. He said, the manager called me in and said, uh, Dave, I'm sorry, but we've traded you. And he said, my heart sank. And he said, then he said, Dave, we've traded you to the Padres. And they thought, whoa, Hawaii, there is a God. He was excited. And then he said, and the Padres are sending you to their double A squad in Amarillo, Texas. <laughs> and he said, but for my wife and I now, Amarillo, Texas is the most beautiful place on earth. I had no idea when I was being sent to Amarillo, Texas that there was another baseball player who had come up in the Yankees organization that had gotten the same call from his Yankee manager that I got from my Pirates manager. And we both ended up in Amarillo, Texas. And my buddy who had come up through the Yankees uh, program was a committed believer in Jesus Christ. He said, I grew up in a faith tradition that kind of taught me I had to work in order for God to like me. 
I thought I was a Christian because I was born in the right family and because I was doing more good things than I was doing bad things. And I learned because I roomed at the Holiday Inn with this guy from the Yankees organization who told me that Jesus loved me unconditionally and he offered me a relationship with him through grace. And there, my wife and I met Jesus. We were baptized in Amarillo, Texas. He said, I wrote my mom and I told her of this new transformation that had taken place in my life. And she immediately told her sister because my aunt was a nun. (laughs) And my aunt, who was a nun, wrote me a letter. And she said, Dave, I am so glad you got traded because you're no longer a pirate. You are now a padre. (laughs) I love it. I love it. But you see, Dravecki thought in Amarillo, Texas, one day he would be awesome in the bigs. And he is awesome in the bigs. In the bigs of sharing the gospel. What took place in Amarillo, Texas is what came to his aid on the ground in front of a pitching mound in a baseball game that ended his career. All I could think of is there's something bigger than in my life. One very practical bit of advice I want to share with you, and I've gone over time. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm really not. (laughs) Dave and Jan uh, Dravecki have gone on to be used mightily in God's work in this world. And some of you might take advantage of some of their resources that are available out there. There is a, um, a website you can go to. You can write this down or you can remember something. If you want to write down the website, it's www.endurance.org. Endurance.org. Or just remember the names Dave and Jan Dravecki. If you only put Dave Dravecki, you'll get lots of other things and probably never find endurance.com or .org. Okay? But if you put both Jan and Dave Dravecki, this, this site will come up. This is a site that they've done for you if you're going through cancer, for your family, who may want assistance for a church who wants to come alongside and help others. If you're a friend, they have all kinds of resources available there of how you grow your faith as you face the adversity that Dave went through, his adversity with cancer. I love a quote I found on there. Cancer is so limited. It cannot cripple love. It cannot shatter hope. It cannot corrode faith. It cannot destroy peace. It cannot kill friendships. It cannot suppress memories. It cannot silence courage. It cannot invade the soul. It cannot steal eternal life. It cannot conquer the spirit. Cancer is so limited. And may I suggest to you, let's take the word cancer out. And let's just say, adversity is so limited. When we understand faith is bigger than life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you know what it is that each of us needed to fill the blank with. That our life is bigger than... There are things of eternal value that every single one of us can be a part of, are a part of. And those things do not have to diminish. But Father, oftentimes, entrusted to you will magnify rather than diminish the sharing of the gospel and the personal sharing of our faith. Thank you for what we will learn more about next week. We commit this to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Hurry up and get out of here.